Okay, we'd like you to welcome you to uh, Trauma EMS Grand Rounds. And today we're going to be talking about ma managing the difficult airway. Jason Cook from uh, LifeLight, he's one of our paramedics, will be speaking to us on that. He also is the educator at Leighton Fire uh, and uh, uh, provides education uh, for them. Uh, just a reminder, at the end, we will open up uh, the uh, mics and uh, if you're out there in Etherland and you can ask questions uh, of Jason. And uh, next, the next speaker will be Corey Taylor and he will be talking about uh, uh, field assessment of trauma patients and uh, that will be September 15th. And in November, we, we actually have Dr. Carl Sager uh, speaking about uh, chest trauma. So. For that, that's it. Jason. Thank, well, thank you. you, Russ. Just to clarify, I'm with AirMed, not LifeLight. So, welcome to the AirMed folks that are here supporting us this morning. So, um, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to come spend a few minutes to talk about what is really probably the most important intervention that we can be doing in the field as EMS providers, which is managing the airway. Truth be told, every life saving thing that we do. Uh, in one way or another helps uh, is, is to correct either a ventilation or a respiration problem and of course included in that is perfusion. And so we're going to spend a little time talking about mostly the ventilation portion of that today and how we can optimize airways in that trauma circumstance to get um, the best outcome possible for our patients. So the question that, that I pose is what is it most of the time that we do when we encounter or come across a difficult airway in the trauma environment? What do most people do, do you think? You would think that they would innovate them, but truth be told, long before that is, we get anxious, we tend to panic, we tend to go through our procedures and the things that we do a bit more rapidly, a little bit more haphazardly, and it adds a little bit more emotion to a scene when we have an airway that doesn't just go off slick the first time. And so what I'm hoping to do today is, is spend a, a few minutes talking about Ways other than innovation, we're going to talk briefly about innovation, but mostly just assessing that time that it would be a difficult airway or a greater potential for a difficult airway. Um, but we're going to talk about other ways to manage airways other than innovation, because I think in EMS we've got it so locked in our head that the only way to manage an airway is with an ET tube, and that's not true. It's absolutely not true. So we're going to spend a few minutes talking about what else can we do. So here's the overview, kind of what we're going to talk about. There's no way in the world we're going to get to all these. Um, probably the most important thing we're going to talk about is down at the bottom, some adjuncts to intratracheal innovation, those rescue airway techniques. But most importantly, we're going to talk about the basics and how is it that we can improve oxygen delivery to our patients without having to stick an ET tube down their throat all the time. Because sometimes we simply won't be able to do that, all right? So real quickly, anatomy airway, every one of us at some point in time in our careers have just been inundated with the airway, the airway, the airway. I'm not going to go over all the structures, but there's one important thing I want to point out that maybe most of us haven't thought about before when we think about the airway. And that is the size of the nasal pharynx up there as opposed to the oral pharynx. We all classically think about the fact that we breathe through our mouth and that we do most of our airway procedures through our mouth. But the reality of it is, is we've got this huge nasal pharynx and this huge nasal cavity up here that we can use to manage the airway with also. And one of the best ways to do that that we'll talk about here in just a minute is with nasal pharyngeal airways and a BVM. All right. Back when a couple of us started in EMS, Scott and myself, uh, we were, I wouldn't say routinely, but certainly on increasing frequency, we would nasally innovate people too. If we didn't have the ability to orally intubate people, we would nasally pass an ET tube down. And it was kind of a forgotten art, and it was something that worked really well. And frankly, now if you came into an ED or a trauma center with somebody that was nasally intubated, most people, I would think, would just freak out because it's something that's not seen. But the nasal cavity is a very, very important part of managing our airway. And of course, we know that the tongue is the other issue that we've got. The tongue is our enemy most of the time when we manage that airway. It gets in the way if we improperly intubate people. It gets in the way if we improperly use our airway adjuncts. It can swell in certain medical emergency cases. It swells in trauma as in burn patients. And so that tongue is our problem. And you can notice how much that tongue occupies of the airway as opposed to this nice airway passage through the uh, nasal pharynx and the nasal cavity with the exception of those turbinates. Of course, the other landmarks that are real important to us is those last ditch effort if we have to do a surgical cricothyroidotomy. We've got the cricothyroid membrane down here. Um, 
The incidence of uh, cricothyroidomy is actually sharply on the decline, mostly because of what we're going to talk about later, the, the increased availability and the effectiveness of good rescue airways that are out there now. Okay, So we'll spend a few minutes talking about this. This is the view we all want to see if we ever get to innovate somebody. Nice epiglottis up here, nice view of the vocal cords, the glottic opening itself, the arenoid cartilage down below. Very, very seldom, if ever, will you get a nice view like that when you innovate people. Most of the time, you're very happy to get the arenoid cartilage and maybe half of the view of the cords. All right? And so the important thing is not so much to always be looking at the glottic opening, as we see here when we innovate people, not so much that we see the whole glottic opening, but that we understand and know the landmarks that we're looking for. And probably the most important landmark, again, is that epiglottis. The epiglottis is our friend. We want to find it first and foremost, because usually if you can find the epiglottis, it becomes very easy to figure out where it is that we now are going to position our blade of choice, either our Mac or our Miller blade of choice, and get that epiglottis manipulated however we choose to, to get it out of the way to open up the glottic opening. All right? Very seldom will we see that view. That's a great day, okay? That's unencumbered with teeth, blood, vomitus, any type of secretions. That's a great airway. That's not a difficult airway, all right? What we're going to talk about today is if I blade somebody and I don't see that, how can I still manage to get that, which is a nice tube pass through the glottic opening. The other issue about this slide is, and it's good and important thing to point out real quickly, is this is a tube that's probably a bit too small for that airway. We have a tendency, especially when we deal with difficult airways, those traumatic events of, you know, the, our pregnancy gals are here. Pregnancy is a difficult time to innovate. Trauma, certainly. We have a tendency of, if I can put an 8.0 tube in somebody or an 8.5 tube, I can for sure get a 7.5 or a 7.0. And one of the things we always have a tendency to do is drop our tube size. Now we have increased airway resistance, and if you couple with that in it, with any kind of chest trauma or anything, now we've got a person that, yes, we have an airway, but now we have a ventilation issue. So the point of it is, choose the appropriate size ET tubes. And the way to do that, other than good experience, is carry with you some reference material, especially when you start dealing with pediatric airways. All right, We all have our rule of thumbs that we tend to use with adult airways, but pediatric airways, very, very, very important that we use in a proper sized ET tube. And don't fight the tendency to go to too small of an ET tube. I left this slide in here not because we don't know. We all know we have four to six minutes before somebody's going to have irreversible, potentially irreversible brain damage from lack of oxygen. Okay, the reason I left this up here, though, is just because historically when we're on scenes and things aren't going well and we've made that first attempt at managing the airway and now we're into that panic mode and we're scrambling for suction and we're scrambling for other equipment and all of a sudden we're doing so many things that aren't airway necessarily focusing on the patient, time goes by really quickly. And if you were to stand back objectively and watch yourself on a video camera later managing a difficult airway, you would be amazed at how much time goes by that we either poorly or don't ventilate people well. So the key to that slide is not how much time do I have, but am I maximizing my time and using my time well, and am I cognizant of my time? All right, it gets really easy for that to go away. So we want to make sure that we're managing that airway, certainly within that 10-minute time frame. And again, that doesn't mean innovation. Good management of that airway, though. Probably the one thing that we don't often think about, uh, well, we do, but not maybe to the extent that we should, is um, there's two components of this whole airway management thing, which is ventilation and respiration. Nicole, what's ventilation? The mechanical act of moving air in and out of the lungs, that's all ventilation is. And normally when we think about airway management, that's what we're thinking about. How do I get some sort of a tube or something that I can maximize airway and get air in and out? The thing that we sometimes don't think about, and we should, is respiration, which is these components of getting air in. We inhale the O2. We have O2 exchange at the member, at the capillary members of the alveoli. We have perfusion there, which means we have to have a good blood pressure, all right? So we have to do those components. A lot of times we'll have poor SATs on a monitor. I've seen it numerous times where we'll pull up on a scene and they'll say, we just can't get the SATs up. And they're bagging. They've got great breath sounds and everything's going to crack, you know, going well as far as the ventilation part goes. And yet they're like, I don't know what's wrong. I don't have any SATs, blah, 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 blah. And you look over at the monitor and they've got a blood pressure of 48 systolic. 
You're never going to get oxygen exchange and CO2 elimination that way. So perfusion is a big part of that, and that's what I mentioned earlier about we have to be mindful of what are our blood pressures and managing those as part of the whole respiration thing. That exchange has to occur, like I just talked about, and then we have to have the ability to get that out. The reason I put this up there is the twofold. One, be cognizant of perfusion status. When you're out there in the field and you've got somebody whose sats aren't coming up, don't always jump on that it's an airway problem. It could be a perfusion problem, and we've seen it happen several times on the flight team. The other issue is be really, really mindful about the rate and quality of how it is that you're ventilating your patient. Not too long ago, I had a flight where a patient had CO2 that were CO2 production that was like at nine. Good intubation, good breath sounds, couldn't figure out why CO2s were at nine. And, and my nurse was panicked that it was a, a perfusion issue, and it wasn't. Perfusion was fine. But everybody was so focused on poor CO2s, poor CO2s, everything, that something's not right, we elected to pull the airway out. And it was the wrong thing to do because right at the time we were getting ready to do that and re-intubate the patient, I happened to notice the rate that the EMT was ventilating the patient at. And we were ventilating at a rate of about 50 times a minute. Well, it's no wonder that we had CO2s of nine. As soon as we got the guy to calm down, relax, woo slow down, okay? All of a sudden, CO2s came up, and we almost pulled a good patent airway because we weren't being mindful of the whole respiration process, too. So keep that in mind. Like I mentioned earlier, almost every true life-saving thing that we're going to do ultimately evolve, revolves around the respiration, ventilation, perfusion equation of the whole thing. And you can see I'm not going to point out all those, but really most of the life-saving things that we do, we're correcting one or more of these problems. And many times they result, resolve around that, uh, that uh, ventilation issue with a good patent airway. How do we measure it? Well, most of the time it's by these things. Um, I will tell you, though, that we're really good at most of the time at getting the, the objective things, those numbers that we can put down on our charts, those numbers that we put down on our forms that we call back to the hospital. But sometimes we miss some of the real obvious or some of the real subtle things. And I highlighted mentation on there, that top one, for a reason. Nothing will give you a better clue about the perfusion and ventilation and respiratory status of your patient like mentation does. Okay, if they're loopy and if you can't attribute their being loopy or dingy to a head trauma event of some sort or some sort of intoxicant medication pills or whatever, you would be amazed at how oftentimes mentation is directly related to hypoxia. It's a very, very early sign of hypoxia. And so if you've got a patient that's just not mentating well, Long before you ever take those vital signs, you can pretty much guess, all right, that they're not going to be, that they're going to be hypoxic or anoxic for some reason. We've got to get on that and measure it. Um, end tidal carbon dioxide is a measurement that uh, predominantly had been mostly just critical care driven, hospitals and flight teams until probably the last four, five, six years maybe. Hopefully now most of your pre-hospital agencies are either have a continuous waveform capnography or are moving to that because it is the gold standard of maintaining an airway. And it's not just are we do we have that whole respiration ventilation thing going, but the best thing about it is it's an instantaneous thing for us to make sure that we haven't lost our airway during the course of moving a patient in and out of ambulances, onto backboards, off of backboards, into helicopters, into hospitals, or whatever. So end carbon dioxide, very, very important. And of course, uh, pulse oximetry as well. What would we ever have done in EMS, Scott, before pulse oximetry came along? <laughs> Look at their color. Imagine that. Look at their color. Look at their mentation. Us old school medics from years ago, all these fancy toys just prove what we already knew which was somebody was either doing well or do, not doing well, oftentimes based on those things that we could see, those subjective things, not the objective things, all right? We have to look at how somebody's breathing. Now, that sounds really silly to say. Of course, we look at people breathing, but no, we don't. No, we don't. The truth is in hospital, especially pre-hospital, EMT and paramedics, and I am one. I do it day in and day out. We are very, very poor at really, truly assessing somebody breathe. We teach all the time that we want to look at respiratory rate and quality of their rhythm. Do they have nice cadence? Do they have good excursion? Are they moving good tidal volumes? All right. Do they have any mechanical reason that they're not breathing well, like a flail chest or uh, you know, a tension pneumothorax or something like that? But the reality of it is we actually like that very bottom thing that I highlighted there says you have to watch people breathe. 
and we don't very often. So don't be afraid, male or female, regardless of the circumstances, expose the chest. Watch people breathe. Make a deliberate, focused attempt to watch people breathe. And that doesn't just mean open and expose the chest and listen to breath sounds real quick and call that your respiratory assessment. It's not. You will miss a lot of things until we watch people breathe. And one of the things that we'll miss is folks that are using their respiratory muscles, diaphragmatic breathing, or trauma, frankly, that we miss most of the times on the posterior surface. So roll your patients over and look at both the anterior and posterior surface of the chest wall and look at the adequacy of breathing. That's going to help you make a lot of decisions about do I manage my airway now on scene, meaning do I innovate them or put a rare rescue airway in, or sometimes RSI people, or are they doing well enough that I can manage them otherwise and get them to the hospital and do it then? Okay, one of the things, especially in the flight environment, that we have to worry about is weighing that balance of are they better being on scene and being managed or being managed in the trauma center. And that's one of the ways, probably the most definitive way, that we can make that determination is a good visual assessment of their adequacy of breathing in their chest wall. All right? So the basics. How do we manage that airway the best? Well, the best way over and over again, and in fact, it got emphasized in the latest American Heart Revision this last year, well, this last year, in 05, and it's going to be further supported, I know, in 09 revision, that the basics are the most important thing to do when we manage the airway. Over and over and over again, you're going to see paramedic pre-hospital rates of success of innovation are steadily on the decline. There's more paramedics now across the country than there's ever been with uh, the, basically the same number of patients that we're treating. So the number of paramedic innovations and EMT and intermediate innovations is on the decline. We don't deal with difficult airways as much. And as a result, we are frankly, less capable, less skilled at managing airways than we've ever been. We really are. But the one thing that we always do is forget how important these basics are. The glamorous thing to do is have a laryngoscope and get to innovate somebody. The glamorous thing to do is get to surgically crack somebody. Never is it thought of as glamorous to pull two nasal pharyngeal airways and an oral pharyngeal airway out and have two people grab a bag valve mask and manage somebody. And yet, statistically and studies have shown over and over and over again, without question, the most important thing. So how do we do it? Well, there's those things that we have to do. Good positioning. It sounds silly, but you'd be amazed at how often we don't optimize airways by doing good airway position and then maintaining it that way. One of the best ways to maintain good airway position, whether it's a trauma patient or not, you're managing an airway, get them on a backboard and put headbed or towel rolls or something on them and a seat collar on them. Manage that airway position to optimize your success. I've talked about OPAs and MPAs. Scott earlier this morning said when he teaches ATLS classes, now they routinely teach placement of two nasal pharyngeal airways and an oral pharyngeal airway. It's a great way to optimize it, but it's so contrary to what's gone on in the past. You'd put one nasal airway in or you'd put one oral airway in. You'd be amazed at how much airway patency you get when you utilize all three of those things on a patient. The other thing I'll say about MP, well, we'll go to this next slide. The other thing about nasal pharyngeal airways is <clears throat> they are really, really underutilized. Uh, I teach at Weber State's paramedic program, and one of the things I love to see is our basics and our paramedics and intermediates, when we teach them, we'll say, they'll say, I'm going to put an oral pharyngeal airway in, and we say, you can't. They're gagging on it. They're coughing. You can't get one in. And they just quit. They're like, well, I'll just, okay, I guess I'll just bag them without one. We forget you don't have to have a gag reflex to put nasal pharyngeal airways in. They can be used all the time. They're actually relatively well tolerated. If lubricated properly with a water-based uh, uh, lubricant, you can actually utilize them very well. They're also a great tool to wake up that feigning unconscious patient along the way, okay? <laughs> Um, that bottom bullet that says should not be used with head trauma, that kind of goes back to the whole mentality of years ago that you don't want to put anything into the, nas into the nares of a trauma patient that could have a basal or skull fracture, an open cribriform plate, because there's that one CT film that's floating around or head uh, x-ray that's got a, an ET tube squirreled around up in somebody's cranial vault. And, of course, that's not going to usually generally give us a good outcome. Okay, but most people, you'd be amazed, you'll say, oh, they've got an open skull fracture right here. Oh, I can't use a nasal pharyngeal airway in them. Yes, you can. You absolutely, you can. The other thought is, is, is that anything through the nares increases ICPs. Actually, statistically, they've not really shown that to be 100% clinically true. But point being, 
manage the airway with good basics, and these are two great ways to do it, all right? So here's a perfect example. One of the other things we never do, very, very, very seldom do, is utilize two people to do good bag valve mass technique, all right? Again, another great way to reduce leaks, to manage positioning properly, to get good rates, tidal volumes, and those kind of things. Get two people down here. The one thing that we teach now all the time is, as much as possible, is to have the other rescuer not necessarily two-handed bag. Because when we two-handed bag, we overventilate, and we'll talk about that in a second. But one of the things that we're teaching our folks to do now up at Weber State and at our agency is to utilize an opposite hand, a non-dominant hand, to provide a little crike pressure, excuse me, a little cellic pressure, so that we collapse the esophagus, we don't overinflate the abdomen and cause the problems that are associated with that. The most prominent one that everybody thinks about is, is well, if I, if I inflate the abdomen, then, it's gonna, then I'm going to get regurgitation. They're going to puke on me. Well, that's true. It will. But the bigger problem is, is if I inflate the abdomen, I inflate the stomach with air, it pushes against the diaphragm. Now it, it increases my inner thoracic pressure. Now I have to bag harder to overcome that inner thoracic pressure. If I have any kind of a leak with my BVM, which you're always going to, or utilizing a BVM, the more pressure you use, the more likely you are to insufflate the abdomen, and that's a vicious, vicious cycle. The end result of it is I have decreased ventilation, and I also have decreased return of coronary circulation because the coronary arteries sit on top of the heart, and as I increase endothoracic pressure, I collapse those down, and now I'm not perfusing the heart, okay? So ventilation rates and insufflation of the abdomen is a very, very big deal, okay, and one of those things that we forget. So how do I take care of the BVM? Well, I have to master the BVM, and we're, like I said, we're not very good at it. We maintain a good airway position, head tilt, chin lift, jaw thrust in a trauma patient, and then, like I said, get it, but then maintain it. Find a way to maintain it in that position. Make sure that we're breathing in a nice assistance way, assisted way in that patient that's still breathing. Most of our trauma patients are going to have agonal or ataxic-type respirations. It's not going to produce, if we bag with them, we're not going to get good um, good respiration and good ventilation going with them. So oftentimes, at least in our environment, we can paralyze them and sedate them and solve that problem. Maintain a good mass seal. Maintain low airway pressures. Remember, the only thing that we want to do is get enough ventilation for chest rise and fall. The worst thing that we can do is collapse the bag. I used to take great pride as a brand new EMT in the fact that I could take a 1500 ml BVM and collapse it so it would form around my hand. And I, because the theory was, if some oxygen was good, more was better. All right, and I'd give them every ounce of it. The reality of it is, as you and I sit here, or as we breathe, we normally breathe in between six and 800 mLs of, of air. Well, you only need to give the same amount or even less because we're providing 100% oxygen as opposed to 21% oxygen in ambient air. So all you need to do is just enough for chest rise. And I don't mean chest rise, just enough for chest rise and fall. So don't overventilate the patient, less likely to cause that problem I talked about of increasing endothoracic pressures from a big abdomen. Of course, using supplemental oxygen, that's a no-brainer. We, we want to increase those O2 sats by providing as close to 100% oxygen as we can, and then watch those O2 sats. But again, keep in mind, failing O2 sats do not always mean do not always mean that we have a respiration ventilation problem. It could be a perfusion problem. So keep an eye on your blood pressures all the time, too. What do we encounter with the BVM? The first thing that you will find, I promise you, next time you're on a scene and you've got somebody, one of your intermediates, your basics, or whomever, and they're bagging somebody, you watch what they're doing because they're not paying attention to what they're doing. They're paying attention to what you're doing. They're paying attention to you getting you, your innovation stuff ready. They're paying attention to you getting your chest tubes or your crike stuff or your monitor. They're talking about what rhythm are they in. They're paying, because this is easy to do. Okay, this is mindless activity right here. And so we get bored. I mean, none of us want to sit and just focus on this. So we start focusing on other things. And before you know it, you've got somebody, although well-intended, that's ventilating somebody at 50 times a minute like that scene that we ran up on. And as soon as you get somebody cognizant of what they're doing, you'd be amazed at how that changes. Poor mass seal, we've already talked about that. Varying ventilatory rates can be very detrimental, especially in the head trauma patient. Okay, varying expiration rates. One of the other problems we get is we retain CO2. We get so many people that we don't let them exhale properly. 
We bag, we keep a little bit of pressure on that bag, and we don't let them excel properly. Now their CO2s can climb, and that can cause us some real problems too. So the most important thing that we can do to solve, if you look at all those, is get everyone to calm down. Okay, a good calming influence on scene, some good reassurance, you being mindful of what your partners are doing while they're bagging. Okay, are they doing two-person mass seal? Are they doing proper ventilatory rates and tidal volumes? You will be amazed at not only the calming influence it has on the scene, and, and, but most importantly, what it's going to do for your patient in the long run. All right, ventilation rates, we know what the ventilation rates are, and the only reason I left that slide in there is because nine times out of ten, I assure you, if you're on a trauma scene and watch how fast we ventilate patients, it's usually two or three times that because of the mentality that we've got that if some oxygen's good, more is better. And in fact, the truth is, Scott and I and, and veteran EMS providers from years ago, because we were taught, I mean, I remember vividly coming out of ENT school and they taught us, you know, ventilate at that rate. And the first time I was on a cardiac arrest patient, traumatic cardiac arrest patient, I was bagging like, and the medic's like, dude, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm bagging them, you know? And he's like, no, you're not. What we do is this. And as soon as the bag filled, we'd ventilate again. And as soon as the bag filled, we'd ventilate again. And it was standard practice. That's what we did forever. Truth be told, we were causing more harm than good to the patient doing that, okay? So watch your ventilation rates. So how do we know we've got adequate ventilation? We'll see these things. Nice equal chest rise and fall, good appropriate rate, heart rate returning to normal. Remember, if somebody's hypoxic, the natural sympathetic response is their heart rate climbs up. We're going to get a heart rate return to normal. SAS are going to improve. Color's going to improve. The one thing that Scott just mentioned, wow, you don't have to have a SAT monitor to see that your patient's improving. They go from that dusky, cyanotic, crappy gray color to nice and pink. All right? Well, that's what we want. And the most important one, I should have bolded it in red, is improving mental status. All right? Sometimes, believe it or not, that can be a problem for us. We have a patient that's been hypoxic, anoxic. We start ventilating them, and now they're a combative trauma patient. Okay? That's a good sign that we're oxygenating and ventilating well and we're getting the brain perfused, but now we have to deal with the, count of the side effect of that, which is we've got a, the game's on, fight's on. How do we know that we've got inadequate ventilation? Well, pretty much just the opposite of all those, okay? No, especially no improvement in mentation of vital signs. So a couple things that we need to think about for intubation. I need somebody to keep track of my time because I'll go on and on and on. Okay. Um, First of all, you have to ask yourself, well, why is it that we intubate? Well, classically, we intubate for one of three reasons. It's because they have a failed airway to either they, they have a failed airway or they cannot maintain their airway or won't. Okay, we see that a lot of times with uh, people that are uh, asthmatics, emphysemics, congestive heart failure patients that are fatiguing, overdose patients that are fatiguing, uh, stroke patients, but always, almost always in trauma, this is the number one reason that we do uh, uh, intubation. The other one is this failure of ventilation and oxygen. Okay, not as obvious sometimes. This one is the one that most people don't think about. What is that predicted clinical course? Maybe they've got a good airway right now. Maybe they're doing just fine, but we know that they're going to go to surgery or that they've got a circumstance like a burn, for example. They've got a good airway now. We've got good breath sounds. They seem to be moving air just fine, but we know that because of this airway burn that they've sustained, that in 20, 30, 40 minutes, that's going to be starkly different. And so we need to intubate them now as opposed to later. A couple of things we can do to determine whether or not that patient does have a good patent airway. This bottom one is the one that we've taught forever. What is their gag reflex? All right. Well, the reality of it is, is gag reflex is a very poor indicator of airway patency. And the best one that we can do is can the patient swallow? Simply ask them, can you swallow for me? If they can perform that mechanical act of swallowing, they have the ability to manage and maintain their airway, okay? And it's a very easy thing to do through the continuum of your care with them is just continue to make sure that they do that. Real, statistically, you'll find that if a patient loses their ability to swallow, they don't have the ability to maintain their airway any longer, even if they have a gag reflex. So just kind of keep that in mind as a barometer for where you're going to go. Of course, if the patient can talk, they are probably got a good airway at the moment. Okay, but again, expected course may mean that that could change very quickly. That whole oxygen ventilation thing, if you look just at this little portion of the, of the PowerPoint, that's just the whole, are we moving oxygen and CO2 back and forth and other cellular waste back and forth? There's a lot of things that can come in the way of that. 
The most prominent one that we that we think about is, is a hemothorax, pneumothorax, tension pneumothorax, something that displaces this membrane right here, okay? Fluid, edema, those kind of things, uh, pulmonary edema uh, on this side of the, in the alveolar wall. Also, anything that interrupts this back and forth, we need to make sure we're getting somebody innovative, okay? One of the things that we'll do to solve this problem is if there's edema, blood, whatever, we can put a little peep on them and, and push that, that oxygen delivery into the cells better, or off the, uh, the uh, red blood cells better. So and then, of course, clinical course. What is clinical course? Yeah, that's that patient that, for whatever reason, you know that they need to get intubated, all right? This is a, obviously an appelled object in the neck. We've had two of those come through the University Hospital in the last two weeks. One of the patients was elected not to intubate, was able to talk, was able to swallow, did just fine without it. All right, with a knife, very similar to that. Okay, another patient, they did choose to innovate because they were afraid of a growing hematoma from a vascular disruption. All right, pretty sure that that one needs to be innovated. I actually had a patient very similar to that not too long ago. It was very easy to landmark their patient. They're, okay, follow the bubbles. Another clinical course, this is a patient, this is a burn patient, and as you can tell, to look initially at the airway, you could probably put a blade in there. You've got the ability to, this is a patient, by the way, it's says nasally intubated. This is an old picture. But look at the difference in swelling, and the times lapse on this is less than a half an hour difference in swelling of the patient. Now you're going to have a much more difficult time getting a rolinergoscope in there and managing this patient. So the take-home is you've got to look at the mechanism behind your airway trauma to see if it's going to change. And the ones that are going to bite you are going to be that rapid onset anaphylaxis, a burn patient with airway burns, and the other one is a developing hematoma from some sort of vascular disruption or airway disruption of the neck. Those are the ones that are going to bite you. So we talk a lot about uh, uh, innovation. You know, you, all of you probably have your favorite blade that you like to use. The only thing I will tell you about your favorite blade is, is that it can sometimes bite you if you're not very comfortable changing and going to a different blade. All right, so I would challenge you as you practice your innovation, practice with the one that you're not most inclined to use because your skills will improve much, much more than you might imagine. Uh, remember um, that the bigger the tongue, the larger the blade you want to use. Generally, they, if they've got a great big tongue, a Mac blade is to your benefit. All right, there are some other blades that I'll show a picture of here that will optimize your view even more. They're great. Positioning of patient, one of the things that you'll always find, not always, often find in the field, especially with inexperienced new people that are innovating, is they're so focused on blade to through the glottis that they don't optimize that patient positioning to best manage that airway. Get that person in a place that you can manage them well. Now, sometimes that's upside down in a car and you can't do it there, all right? But other times it might be in the back of the ambulance or somewhere where you can raise a gurney or position them such that you get a much better view of your airway, okay? Placement, remember, like I mentioned, the tongue's our enemy. We've got to get that tongue out of the way. A nice uh, right to left sweeping motion with both blades is what you want to get in the habit of doing. You'll see a lot of people go straight in and then just lift up, and, and especially with a Mac, or excuse me, a Miller blade, you'll have that tongue in your way all the time. Get in the habit of going right corner of the mouth up and to the left, all right? It's almost a 45. You're aiming for that left toe of the patient. And that, of course, should open up and expose our epiglottis. Once we find the epiglottis, we look for the arytenoids, and then hopefully we've got a good view like we saw before. The burp technique. What's the burp technique, Scott? Backward, upward. Exactly. Backward, upward, rightward pressure, okay? Um, our doctor here refers to it as ELM, external laryngeal manipulation. What it is, and I'll show a picture of it here and we'll come back. No, I won't. I'll show you here in a second. What we want to do is not every single person's airway is just to put the, put the blade in, find the cords, and everything's perfect. But sometimes just slight manipulation of the airway by the innovator, not by somebody else trying to do it for you. That, oh, oh, yeah, oh, no, no. But what you can do is just a little ELM, a little backward, upward, rightward pressure will oftentimes bring that airway into view. Then what we want to do is say, Nick, do me a favor. Come hold this right here. And oftentimes they won't. They'll let it go. So then you got to take their hand in your hand and move it back and put it right there and get them innovated. So that's a good burp technique. Innovating stylets. You should always be using a stylet. 
Okay, I don't know. There's a lot of old school guys that see it as kind of a crook or a crutch if uh, you have to use a stylet. Well, the reality of it is, is you should be putting a stylet in your ET tube every single time you innovate somebody. It's very easy if you blade somebody and put the tube in and you don't need the stylet to go, hey, dude, we pull that out real quick. Okay, but it's much different if you go and innovate somebody and you're trying to jam the tube in there and it's bending and twisting and turning and you have to take out and find a stylet and do all that over again and then reblade somebody. Okay, much easier, much more efficient if we always get that stylet in there. And we're going to talk about a couple adjunct stylets that will help us here in a minute. One of the things, the reason that this is in here, this is uh, almost now everywhere when you look about innovation and managing a difficult airway, you will see this oxygen desaturation curve. And what the oxygen saturation curve simply means is we were always taught that you've got 30 seconds to innovate somebody. 30 seconds. If you don't get a tube in 30 seconds, you got to pull it out. And that's what... Okay. That's what contributed a lot of times to that very rushed, haphazard pace of, of slamming an ET tube and trying very vigorously to get an ET tube placed in somebody. The reality of it is if you get a person that's saturated above 90, and in fact our protocols here are 93, but if you can get somebody saturated above 93%, the normal healthy, the normal healthy person, you know, which we, of course, aren't running into, this isn't our patient profile, They'll maintain SATs above 90% for upwards of eight minutes. And if any of you have gone and innovated in an OR, what am I keep running into? Oh, okay. Um, you, you will find that, especially if you've worked in the field for a while and you're so used to bagging somebody all the time, the anesthesiologist, they'll bag them up and then they'll get busy doing other things and you're kind of like wanting to go bag the patient. They're like, he's fine, he's fine, leave him alone. All right, the point of it being, get them saturated well, get their SATs up above 90, 93%. You're going to have at least, even an obese patient, even an obese, which is the worst patient we can have, pediatric patient is right there with them, moderately ill patient, which is the ones that we often come across. If you look at that 90 percentile mark of saturations, you have at least several minutes. Okay, at least several minutes. Now, you don't necessarily want to take all that, but my point of it is, calm down. You've got some time. As long as, long as they're maintaining their SATs above 90%, you're fine. Get everybody to slow down and relax, and your success rates will go up a bunch. Typical airway equipment that we have that we use, we all know what they are. The MAC blade is probably the one that most people like because it's got this wide flange that gets the tongue out of the way. We know that with this one, we move the distal tip up into the vallecula and, the, and that the epiglottis sucks up below there. Wow. And I went the whole, the whole, yeah, there's a hot mic or something. I went the whole lecture without doing that. Um, the one thing about the MAC blade that I will say is that it's a very poor choice in pediatric patients. The reason being is when we move that into the vallecula and we lift that epiglottis up, kids have a very large floppy epiglottis, and it hangs on the bottom of the blade and still obstructs your view of the glottic opening. In pediatrics, you always want to use a Miller blade if at all possible. Even if you're not comfortable with it, that is the blade of choice. So you can get in, lift that epiglottis up, and get it up and out of the way. All right? Wisconsin. Any ideas? <laughs> this one I don't think has got a volume. Um, I'll keep going while they're working on it. This Wisconsin blade is not one that you typically see in the EMS environment much. What it is, it's a hybrid of the two blades. It's got a little bit of a flange on it um, that helps move the tongue up and out of the way, uh, similar to what the Miller blade does, or excuse me, similar to what the Mac blade does, but it's got that longer, straighter pro profile that the Miller blade does, and you use it like a Miller blade, uh, you would a Miller blade, but it has a tendency to get the tongue out of the way better, all right? But again, you don't tend to see those very much pre-hospital at all. Um, our typical innovation tubes and stylets, those kind of things, the only reason I left that up here is take your time to get your equipment put together right away at the very beginning. The last thing you want to do is be fumbling through your bag trying to find a stylet once you've already made one innovation attempt and you had a good view of the cords then, you just couldn't get the tube through, so now you've got to pull back out and in the meantime something's changed and now you don't get a good view. What you want is to optimize that first chance path success, okay? Another thing about tubes now is um, forever and ever and ever we were taught 
pediatric tubes are uncuffed tubes. Uh, there are now pediatric cuff tubes of all sizes um, that take advantage of the fact that the narrowest part of a pediatric airway is distal to the cords as opposed to an adult where it's at the cords. But we can solve the problem of dislodged in pediatric tubes now uh, and the air leaks associated with pediatric tubes by using cuff DT tubes now. And I think you're going to see that. Uh, we've switched to them here. Most uh, pre-hospital folks are starting to switch to them, and that is going to be standard care here very soon is having those cuff tubes. Um, when things don't quite go right, so you, you put that blade in there, and, and you, for whatever reason you can't get an intubation done. The dumbest thing that you can do is do that exact same procedure again the exact same way and expect a different outcome. Okay, that's the definition of insanity, is doing the same thing twice and expecting a different outcome. Change something up. Use a different blade. Okay, switch between one of those. Reposition the patient. Use some sort of a, dis a, a change in the, in the way that you uh, form or shape your ET tube. A lot of people like that big sweeping curving uh, ET tube. It actually makes it more difficult, in many people's opinion, mine especially, of actually getting an ET2 pass that way as opposed to that gentle hockey tip slope. All right? Do that ELM. My personal experience is the ELM is the most optimal way to get a good view of those cores. All right? Another thing, there's a thing out there called the two-person technique. If you haven't seen it, you can Google it on the web. There's actually a video out there on Google Video of the two-person innovation technique. But in a nutshell, you have a one person that's the, the laryngoscopist. You put the, the laryngoscope blade in. You get it where it's supposed to be. Then you have your partner come across the patient's chest and lift up this way with the handle. And you would be amazed. It's like the Wizard of Oz. The gates open, and all of a sudden, there's the glottic opening. And it's huge. And, and, and now you've got two hands to manage the airway because somebody else is managing your endoscope. It's a great technique to use. All right, and worse, you know, next option, certainly not the worst option is get your ego out of the way and have somebody else innovate. All right, we're all going to have days that we do well, and we're all going to have days that we don't do well. And experience levels differ, emotional levels and attachment to your patient differ, and sometimes somebody else can pop in and manage an innovation just fine. And we actually see that a lot here on the helicopter. Guys on scene will be working their guts out. They're doing a great job. They're doing every single thing right. They just can't do it, and we'll, we'll just through good fortune, not that we've done anything different, other than change a couple things, we'll manage to get the airway. So something to think about. A couple other blades that are out there that you might see is the ViewMax and the GrandView. We actually have this one at the other place that I work. It's a great blade. It's a hybrid of both the Miller and the Mac. It's got that great big wide flange. It's got this very long deck to it that gives you a wonderful view of the epiglottis. The thing that's cool about it is you can use it as a Mac or a Miller blade. It works great. That little gold tip at the end of it makes visualizing where it is, either in the molecular or getting the epiglottis out of the way, great. These ViewMax blades, there's a little viewfinder in there, and it gives you a, a magnified view of the glottis from that little viewfinder, and it's also a very cool way to innovate. So again, just some things you can add to your toolbox to increase your effectiveness of managing that difficult airway. Scott already mentioned that uh, ELM or BERT technique. It's a wonderful way to get your cords lined up. It's one of those things that if you don't make it a habit, you will probably not do or you won't do it when you best should, which is when you first innovate. Most people are taught grab your laryngoscope handle, grab your ET tube, and go to work. The best thing that you can do is leave your ET tube down Get your uh, uh, laryngoscope blade put in there, and using your other hand, do your ELM, get that airway where you want it, have somebody hold it, then go ahead and innovate. It differs from the Selleck maneuver in that the Selleck maneuver, remember, the only thing we're trying to do with the Selleck maneuver is collapse the esophagus, prevent air from entering the stomach, and dealing with that whole increase of intra-abdominal, intra-thoracic problem that we've got. Most people mistakenly think that when they're doing the Selleck maneuver, which is fingers on the thyroid cartilage to collapse that pliable esophagus down, that they're actually doing ELM. They're not. They're different things. All right? You can have, when you do ELM, some of the effect of the Selleck maneuver, which is great. It's an added benefit. But they are not the same thing. I mean, you'll hear people interchange them all the time, but they're not the same thing. So the Selleck maneuver, again, is to prevent... Uh, regurgitation and we maintain it throughout innovation, all right, whereas ELM is meant to bring those cords into anatomical view better for us, okay? Um, 
And all of you have at one time or another seen somebody do that. And in fact, veteran guys that have innovated forever will tell you that a lot of times you'll have somebody that's a very well-intended EMT or whatever, right as you're going to innovate and you happen to get that perfect view and they'll go, here, I'll help you. And they'll do a little what they think is cry pressure, sell it pressure, thinking that they're helping you and they will actually distort your view. And a lot of times if you just very gently just say, move, you know, <laughs> you'll, uh, you'll get a much better view, so. That ELM is what they're demonstrating there, using that non-innovating hand to get the cords where you want. Have somebody else hold them and hand them your tube so that you can then pass the tube. It's a great, great way to do uh, innovation. The bougie is something that's been used in Europe for a long, long time, and now it's really working its way into mainstream airway practice here. The thing that's nice about the bougie is, is that it's designed to be used as a blind insertion technique, absent using a laryngoscope. And the theory of it is, especially with this more rigid one is, is, is that as that distal tip passes through the glottic opening and hits the tracheal rings, you'll actually feel it bounce or shudder across the rings. Now, I don't have near enough dexterity to feel that, but the one thing I have noticed is when I've used it is if I preload an ET tube and use that as a stylet, in those occasions where I can't get the ET tube in, I am able to advance this, and then I'm able to manipulate my tube a little bit more and can use the, the tube. Um, the other thing that this, we don't often teach it a lot or talk about it a lot, but this is great for those very infrequent times where you might have to do a digital innovation on somebody. We're actually using your fingers as a quasi-laryngoscope blade, and you're having to, in the old days, we used to try and insert the tube down over our finger, and if you had big, fat fingers and a small mouth, you weren't getting it done. Well, now you can insert your fingers in there and that person that's inverted in a car or trapped in a vehicle or whatever, and you can use that to get into the glottic opening and then feed a tube down over the top of it. And it actually works quite nicely if it's something that you've practiced before. So another couple of things to add to your toolbox to improve your success rate. How do we confirm innovation? Well, your agencies are going to have very specific things that they're going to tell you you have to do. At the very least, you should be able to document five basic fundamental things. I visualize the tube going through the core. I have condensation in the tube. I have good chest rise and fall. I have breath sounds with absent epigastric sounds, and I have some sort of a confirmation device that says I'm in. Now, whenever I talk about those five things, somebody goes, Jason, condensation in the tube is not an, ind an indication of innovation. You're right. Alone, it's not. But in concert with those other things, it's a very good indication that you're in, okay? The other things that we need to be doing is using a confirmation device. Up until the 2005 revision of American Heart Association, they were secondary confirmation devices. They're not. They're primary confirmation devices. There's a couple out there on the market. You can choose. Your agency can choose what they want. Um, I will tell you that this, uh, the turkey-based or looking syringe one, is far better at determining airway patency or, or that you're in the esophagus than the bulb is, just so you know. Okay, they've got some age and size restrictions on them, too, that you'll want to be mindful of. A lot of people are use the, the end tidal CO2 caps. Um, they can sometimes give you false readings. Remember that we want what color change? What do we want to see if a good innovation? Yellow. Gold is golden. That means we're great, okay? Purple is poor. And then you sometimes get that in between, that tan color. T for tan is think. Stop. Don't pull your tube out necessarily. Stop and think for a second. Okay, you could be in. You could have a perfusion problem. You could have some other problem. You could also not be in. But don't immediately jump to pulling the tube if you get a tan color. You may want to revisualize. You may want to do some things, but don't automatically jump on it. The standard of care, though, is continuous waveform capnography. All right? Um, it's a great indicator for us. This is something that we never want to see when we're moving our patient because like this bottom one shows is something was going really well, and then something went poorly. We've lost CO2. It means the patient's either stopped breathing, we've not ventilated the patient properly, but the most likely culprit for that is, is that we've dislodged the tube. The one time that you won't see this and you'll have a tube dislodged, if this, the tube gets dislodged but it still sits just at the top of the glottic opening or is super glottic, uh, and you can still get some change in the waveform. So the take home to that is if you've had nice continuous waves that are consistent and you have a change in that waveform, you need to do some troubleshooting to figure out why that's the case also, okay? Um, Post-innovation management, there's a lot of things we know that we have to do. The most important one is just reassess, 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 reassess. If you're the airway person of your team that day, 
when you manage that airway, however that is, your job is not done. Your job is not then to help your partner with managing drugs or defibrillation or chest tubes or whatever. Your job is to manage and maintain that airway. Your job is to make sure, make sure that that thing doesn't go away. So secure it. Keep it properly positioned and constantly reassess to make sure it's where it's supposed to be. All right? And then this one, too, is an appropriate one. Sometimes, inevitably, we're going to have to pass off the job of ventilating that patient that we've now innovated or managed that airway. We're going to have to pass it off to somebody, okay, an intermediate, a, a, you know, partner, or paramedic, whatever. Um, watch them. Make sure that they're getting only good chest rise, they're not overventilating, they're not over to giving too much tidal volume, that they're only doing what we need them to do and certainly not more, okay? Um, real quickly, we're stopping right at 11 o'clock, as cl close to it as I can, okay. Real quickly, there are a lot of other options now out there in managing the airways, these superglottic airways. So know what your options are. If you work at an agency that you don't have some type of a rescue airway, you should get one. Absolutely, you should get one. And there's several out there to choose from. Um, a couple things for us specifically in the air medical environment, um, we need to know when it is that people are using supraglottic airways. And most of the time, it's because of a failed airway. It's some patient that they've attempted to manage by innovation, haven't been able to, and have had to resort to using a rescue airway. That's a great big clue for us. That means that maybe we might be able to manage that airway with innovation, but there's a high probability that we may not. So don't automatically pull that airway just because it's not an innovation. If you've got good airway compliance, if you're getting good ventilation with that thing, and you've got good vital signs to support that it's working well, probably the smartest thing you can do is leave it alone, secure it and leave it alone. The other thing is, is becoming a primary airway for non-innovating agencies, especially here in rural Utah and across the rural West, there's a lot of agencies that are intermediates and intermediate advances, advanced that don't innovate, but still need some more definitive way to manage an airway than OPAs, MPAs, and a BVM. And that's where these airways are being utilized a lot. So if you work in an environment where you inherit patients from rural areas or you fly out to them or you work in one of those rural areas, you might be using one of these as your primary airway. Across the country right now, I had a discussion with Russ just before this. There is strong evidence, and it's been proven in statistical study, study after study, our, our success rate and our skill level at innovation, endotracheal innovation, is on the decline in pre-hospital care. And as a result, we're bringing in more patients across the country with unrecognized misplaced ET tubes than we ever have. And as a result, medical directors across the country are not comfortable with having paramedics innovate any longer and are looking to use alternative airways as, as their primary means of managing those airways. So it's something that we're going to see more and more and more of, all right? The other times we see them are in those failed airway attempts where we can't innovate, can't ventilate. If, if you haven't studied hospital or pre-hospital management of an airway, you have a patient that you can't intubate and you can't ventilate, that is a dead patient. All right, and that's the other advantage of those rescue airways, all right? So the rescue airway techniques, there's, there are several of them, and in fact, since I originally did this PowerPoint, there's even a few more. I'm only just briefly going to talk about these three, and then we'll call it quits. Kind of the first one that came along was the combi tube. It was a double lumen tube. It was something you could pass blindly with a very high success rate. Um, there were some contraindications associated with it. These contraindications are pretty much the same for almost all supraglottic airways, all right? Um, like all of the supraglottic airways, it is not a definitive airway, but that shouldn't deter you from the fact that it can be, especially in the traumatic or very difficult airway, a very, very good airway, okay? Um, the other benefit of it is, is it is something you can put a suction catheter down, an NG tube down, and deflate the stomach so that we're not dealing with those gastric complications of intubation. But it's a blind thing. You stick it in, you know. Uh, the, the downside to the combi tube is, is is that because it's a double lumen airway, there was always the potential that you could inadvertently intubate somebody with them. So there's two tubes. One of them is the fenestrated outer tube uh, that most of the time that we ventilate through, we have this very large uh, balloon that sits in the oral pharynx when we intubate it and another one that sits down in the esophagus to hopefully prevent uh, regurgitation and, and, and uh, movement of gastric contents up. Um, but it's not certainly a perfect system. 
Um, and so what you would do is you would ventilate through the white tube, and if for whatever reason you didn't get good airway indications that you were where you were supposed to be, you may have inadvertently intubated somebody, so then you ventilate through this blue tube, and you can ventilate down through the distal port. Um, many places still carry these. Like I said, they were kind of the very er, the predecessor, the very beginning of uh, the new supraglottic tubes. Some of you older medics may remember the old EOA, esophageal obturator airway, which was kind of a, another version of this, and it didn't work really well, so we seldom used it. Um, but this is a good tube, and in fact, my agency used this for a while until we switched. Uh, but again, you'll see them. The problems you're going to associate with is people not recognizing which proper tube to ventilate with, and then the other problem you'll oftentimes have is is under inflation of these tubes to keep them properly positioned. They don't secure them well. Um, the LMA is another device that has been around forever. It's been around forever and ever and ever. They've used it in ORs uh, electively for a long time. Um, the downside of the LMA is, is that just like the combi tube and the King, you don't get complete airway protection from regurgitation. Um, but in the OR, that's no big deal because they're MPA. They've come in without eating or drinking anything for 12 hours. Uh, the anesthesiologist has been able to do this wonderful assessment to determine if you can use the LMA. We don't have that luxury in any case, all right? Uh, but nonetheless, the LMA has found a home in pre-hospital care, and it's being used out there. And, in fact, there are several agencies along the Wasatch Front that use the standard LMA as their primary rescue airway. Um, there are the contraindications that you'll see. The benefit of that over the combi tube, the combi tube, there's only two sizes too, basically a big adult and a small adult, uh, and, the, and there was a large portion of the pediatric population that you could not manage the airway with. The LMA, one of the advantages of the LMA is, is that it came in sizes small enough that you could pick up the pediatric population and manage their airway well too. Um, but you can't suction through them. And so if you had this problem of somebody that had been bagged, had this great big belly, and now you're worried about that, you can't suction through those. And, in fact, you will deal with regurgitation. Like I mentioned, tons of sizes. They seal around the glottic, uh, glottic inlet. This great big you know, pillow or balloon, if you will, uh, inflates and, and pretty much isolates off the glottic opening, and then we're able to then ventilate through it. One of the things that they adapted is, is this innovating uh, uh, ILMA or innovating LMA. Um, because this, when we place it properly, sits just above the glottic opening, the philosophy was, well, if I make one big enough through here that I can pass an ET tube through, there's only one place that ET tube can go, that's through the glottic opening, and now I can innovate them. And that's exactly what this is designed to do. Um, very expensive. Uh, it's not a reusable device. It has to be sterilized at a hospital facility. So it was kind of a cost, cost prohibitive thing for pre-hospital care. It is for most places. Um, in the last two years, they've developed and then perfected the um, disposable ILMA. And, in fact, you're seeing those carried in a couple of places across Wasatch right now, too. Probably the biggest problem associated with this is, is because you can intubate through it, most people think, well, if I've got the patient intubated with this tube now, I don't need this great big contraption occupying their mouth. And they would attempt, because you can kind of retrograde move the LMA off, they would actually uh, extubate the patient inadvertently. So the one thing that we teach here when we use them here and elsewhere is once you get that in and you get that ET tube in, leave the whole damn thing there, okay? Just secure it and leave it in place there, okay? And that's exactly how that works. If you remember the anatomy uh, picture that we looked at before, here's the distal part of our airway. It sits right up over that glottic opening and tends to ventilate very nicely through there. The other airway that's come out in the last probably four or five years is the, um, th this version, the manufacturer of this is the King, uh, but the LT airways, this is the King LT, and there's a, they actually have four that they have now. But the King LT, the thing that's cool about the King LT is like the LMA, there are several sizes that includes the pediatric population. The benefit of this over a combi tube is, is that you cannot inadvertently innovate somebody with it because of its length and shape. So it is a true supraglottic device. Uh, just like the combi tube, you ventilate through multiple distal ventilatory openings there. The other nice part about this particular one is, is that it's open at the distal tip, so you can run an NG tube down through it and suction through it. Um, there's only one opening, so it solved that whole which one do I ventilate through kind of problem. And it comes packaged as a nice kit that's got, you'll notice that there's only one inflation port for the balloons, 
uh, those balloons are actually joined so that you only have to in, uh, inflate one balloon as opposed to the two balloons of the combi tube. So it's a very nice, compact, easy to carry, great airway. Uh, the other place I use, uh, the other agency I work for, this is our this is our rescue airway that we've used many, many times and have great success with it. And actually in many places across the country now, they are intentionally taking oropharyngeal airways off their rigs and replacing them with King LTs because if a place, patient can take an oropharyngeal airway, they can take a King LT airway and then you've got much better isolation of the airway with this. So it's a great airway device. Looks kind of similar to an ET tube when you inherit them. The reason you'll know that it's a King or any one of these LT airways as opposed to an innovation is that they have a colored tip. The colored tip corresponds with which size they are. Um, you don't really need to know the colors so much as that each one of those is a little bit different in size. Okay, they're based on patient height, not weight. And you can see that that's where they sit. Those, so you ventilate through the trachea, through those, the distal tip sits in the esophagus. You can run, a, like I said, a suction syringe down through there. They have marks on them just like an ET tube does so that you know where you've properly secured them. And it's a great little device, something you'll probably see more and more of out there in the field. So. The point of all that was there's a lot of options out there for us when we have difficult airway, a lot of options. The most important take home of this whole thing is difficult airway or airway management does not always mean innovation. It means managing the airway. And there's lots and lots of ways we can manage the airway. Um, this quote is out of the Manual of Emergency Airway Management, which in my opinion is really the Bible on pre-hospital and hospital-based managing of airways and especially difficult airways. You can buy it off of Amazon.com or off the difficultairway.com website. Um, and, and in this, you can see that quote about master bag, ma bag and mask ventilation. There are very few airway emergencies pre-hospital that cannot be managed adequately with proper bag valve mask technique and have that patient transported. And that is true. And in fact, if you always, always, always default to good BVM, two-person, CELIC maneuver, optimizing the airway with OPAs and MPAs, you will be amazed at how well you ventilate people, okay? The other one is, is always weigh the risks of, uh, and risks and of innovation in the pre-hospital setting as opposed to transporting. Um, the, the benefit of that is, and like we talked here just before we got started today, that's a delicate balance for us sometimes in pre-hospital. Do I take the time especially if I have that patient that I'm predicting to be a difficult airway. If I take the time and manage this airway and I have complications and they seem to be doing okay or if I can manage it otherwise and I either RSI them and now I've got a trouble or if I go to innovate them and I end up causing more trauma to that airway which now causes me to have a difficult airway, I might have been better off just taking them to the ED and managing them otherwise. So as good clinicians, as good airway managers, the thing that I think that we need to ask ourselves always is, one, is this something I have to do here? Two, are there better ways for me to do it, either with BVM, good technique, or with alternative airways? And then the last thing is, is if no, I don't want to use an alternative airway, yes, I'm comfortable with this innovation, yes, I think this, this is the time and the place to do it. And then the other thing that we need to do is calm down, slow down, Make sure people understand that you've got the time to do this and do it well. Get all the tools that you've got in your toolbox assembled to do it well, and then take the time to do those few techniques that are going to optimize your first pass success rate of innovation. Um, and then other than that, the, the whole thing is just to keep it from going away once you get it, which is, can be a real treat. And so manage, uh, you know, manage those patients well, uh, package them well, and uh, celebrate your successes with airway management. And that's all I got. How'd I do? Oh, any questions from anybody? So I know these guys don't. I threaten them within an inch of their life. They have none. <laughs> so any questions from anyone? All right. Well, thanks. I appreciate the opportunity. And uh, oh, by the way, one other thing. Um, any of you that are watching this or watching the recorded version of it, if you would like this PowerPoint, this is an abbreviated version of a much longer uh, PowerPoint that includes uh, surgical cri cricothyroidotomy and a bunch of other stuff about assessing the difficult airway and the airway algorithms. If any of you would like this, you can get my email from Russ, and I'm happy to uh, either uh, send it to you or maybe there's a website that you can put it up on that I can give it to you. So. Okay.
Super. So anyway, feel free to contact me if I can help you in any other way. So thanks.